Gentlemen, we have gone live. So anytime you're ready to start the meeting, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Leslie. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Okay, well, let's start off. I'll call the meeting to order. We'll call the meeting time at 1.40 p.m. on Thursday, July the 9th. I'll look for a motion to approve the agenda as permitted. I'll make that motion. Okay, Paul, thank, Paul you. thank you, Paul. All in favor? Um, you might want to use the, uh, the hands button for that. Or just show me your hand. That should be more than sufficient. All right. Thank you. Moving on to item two, which is the minutes of the May 22nd EMS committee meeting. Has everybody had a chance to look at the minutes? And if you have and there are no changes, could I get a motion to approve the minutes? I move acceptance of the minutes as presented. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, can we have a vote on that, please? Show of hands. Right, thank you. All right, we have no delegations. Um, business arising from the minutes. Seeing none, we'll move on. Update from district. Uh, District Chiefs, do you want to have a little session on that right now? Yeah, I suggest we do the business with Stu first, and then if we've got time at the end, that we do the usual from the fire chiefs. Okay. That that's more than acceptable. Okay, well, so we'll move and leave that one in the parking lot for right now. We'll move to number six, new business. If you will turn to page three of your agenda, you'll see there's a memo that I have prepared for you. And so on June the 9th, uh, council did approve and support the EMS's recommendation to hire uh, Montane Forest Management Limited to undertake the municipal emergency plan. So that was, we move forward with that. And noted that part of the deliverables is a project work plan that uh, Mr. Stu Walkenshaw is to present to the CAO fire chief and to the uh, emergency service committee members. So at this point, I'm going to pass it over to Rick. If you could do a short introduction for Stu and perhaps Stu can just walk us through um, the work plan. Okay, Stu, Stu Walkinshaw is um, president of Montane Forest Management Limited. He's uh, <clears throat> been in the forestry business, and I let him, he should probably do his own intro, but he's been at this many, many, many years. Um, he's uh, done a lot of emergency planning as well as working in forestry. Um, he's done to help uh, the towns of Camore, uh, town of Banff, town of Cochrane, and uh, some others with their municipal emergency plans. So, uh, and, you know, um, he's this is Stu, and I get he can't see his picture, but he can add to his uh, to my introduction of him. Okay, uh, thanks, Rick. Um, can everybody hear me there? Yes, welcome, Stu. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so, first of all, I'm uh, I'm uh, it's honored uh, to be a part of the project and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, the work plan that I put forward uh, basically follows the format that was in the pro uh, proposal that uh, uh, was evaluated originally. Um, so I've put it forward as uh, a five-step process, uh, starting with project commencement, uh, project work plan, from there, moving through into the review of existing documents, policies, and bylaws. Once that's done, moving into the actual uh, development of the new municipal emergency management plan to an ICS uh, framework. 
And then step four is uh, what I've referred to as presentation of draft and deliverables. So there were several uh, pieces uh, that needed to be presented uh, uh, both to this committee as well as to council. And step five was uh, the, the training and exercise uh, that was a part of the project. If you flip to the last page of the work plan, that's probably the easiest place to kind of look at the, at the flow, um, the key milestones and the completion dates for each. Um, so step one, uh, the project commencement meeting uh, was completed uh, on June the 24th uh, uh, with Rick Lister. Now, the work plan was submitted June the 30th, and uh, we're just in the process now of uh, presenting that work plan uh, to the committee. Um, from there, uh, move on to step number two, and I'll get started with reviewing the existing documents uh, and the policies and bylaws. The, I've uh, suggested that the uh, summary report will be prepared and submitted by the end of July, uh, July 31st. And then uh, I've put a two week time frame in there where I can then present that summary report uh, to yourselves. Uh, from there into step three, um, I'll get going on uh, preparing the new municipal emergency management plan. And one of the things that uh, Rick and I had talked about uh, at the project startup meeting was uh, we are going to do a new hazard and risk vulnerability assessment. So uh, uh, Rick will put a group together um, and we'll work through a, uh, a fairly uh, regimented process to uh, uh, prioritize uh, the hazards uh, that uh, are within the MD. From there, um, I'll work through and, and build the new plan. And uh, my suggestion is that that draft uh, municipal emergency management plan submitted uh, no later than September the 15th. Um, and then uh, a presentation again to the committee uh, on that draft plan and uh, looking for comments back uh, from uh, the committee. A uh, final municipal emergency management plan based on those revisions that are recommended by November the 15th and then a final presentation to MD Council um, and I just put based on council availability, uh, you know, simply because it's, it's difficult to determine exactly when uh, they may be available. Um, and then uh, uh, step number five, uh, the training and exercise, uh, I've kept it exactly as it was um, in the original proposal. Um, uh, December the 15th, 2020. Um, and then I just put in there, um, as determined by uh, the MD staff availability and COVID protocols, um, simply because some of these workshops are, are much better done in person rather than um, uh, via Zoom or, or Microsoft Teams. So it might be something where, as we see how the COVID uh, uh, pandemic progresses, we may wish to delay that at some point. Um, that's about it for the work plan, uh, short and sweet. Well, thank you, Stu. Um, do the committee members have any questions regarding the work plan? I would just like to make one comment to Stu and his original submission. I appreciated the fact that he followed what the MD put out step by step, so it was much easier to evaluate than uh, quite a few other submissions. And that was greatly appreciated by me. Thank you. Uh, there's a question for Rob. Um, when there's... Um, going to be some financial implications to this. Uh, we probably want the information uh, to council was uh, around budget time. Uh, and uh, how do you think we should 
um, do that. We will. Yeah, Paul, um, we'll be fine. Um, uh, the Montaigne's proposal came in under budget. And the training session is included as part of the approval. So we don't have to go and, and receive any more monies from council. Oh, I was, I was thinking of uh, actually 2021 budget, uh, Rob. Uh, if there's anything that might come out of this report that would uh, require us to have an item into the 2021 budget, would we have enough information to uh, have that uh, available given this time frame? Yeah, looking at step number three on that last page that Stu had us walking through for the key milestones, I think there'll be plenty of right, time that's what, from September through October to see the draft plan to see if there's any financial implications for the for the budget. Thank you. Yeah, good. That's a good answer. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I have a, Stu, I have a question for you. So as part of the risk uh, assessment, the risk analysis you're doing, does that tie into a, a review of any evacuation plans or the need thereof? Right. So uh, that is actually up in step number two, uh, Rob. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a part of the review of those existing documents, um, and that summary report, yes. uh, a part of that was to review what you have right now for evacuation planning okay. and to make recommendations um, as to whether you should move forward with, with something uh, else. Okay. So that'll be done as a part of step number two. Excellent. Thank you. Do under uh, the um, hazard assessment and risk vulnerability assessment, um, <clears throat> how broad will that be? Uh, um, because we've had so many uh, kind of natural disasters over the last five years, and uh, not just El uh, not just uh, in the MD, but throughout Alberta and throughout BC and throughout Australia and throughout California and so on. Are you going to be approaching those, uh, dealing with those? Yes. So how the process works is uh, uh, we sit down with a, a tight group of folks from the committee um, or as as Rick sees necessary. And, and, and we run through a process and we say, OK, let's pick all of the different hazards that you may face. And that could be. Uh, train derailments, it could be snowstorms, flooding, wildfires, etc. Um, and then and then the way a hazard and risk vulnerability assessment works is that we then quantify the probability and the consequence of each of those different um, of each of those different hazards. And what it does at the end of the day is it gives you a ranking as to what your highest priority is and your lowest priorities. So I think in answer to your question, yes, it'll look at all of the different threats that the MD of Bighorn could face. Um, and what it does do is it, it tends to pick on those ones that really are, are not all that important to spend a lot of time on. Um, and it gives you an idea as to which ones you should spend more time on. Thank you. You just Hi. mentioned, uh, Stu, you just mentioned a probability and ranking the different risks. Have you got some information that you can access that actually gives us a probability based on some statistics? Or how is that probability going to be arrived at? <clears throat> yeah, the probability and the consequence are, are, are just a numbered scale. 
from one to five. And those numbers are chosen by the people that are in the room doing the hazard and risk vulnerability assessment. So okay. We say, okay, so what's the probability of an airplane crashing into uh, Lactis Arc? And the probability is extremely low of that. So you might set it as a one. What's the consequence of it? The consequence could be a five. Um, and so that's kind of where it, it just gets set by the people sitting at the table that know the MD and emergency management in the MD best. Okay, thank you. That answers it very well. Yeah, and I, I assume uh, this is, you know, being forward looking, uh, historical stats aren't going to necessarily be the best indicator, especially in light of, you know, changing climate, et cetera. My, I had a question around um, what might be appropriate in terms of informing and uh, notifying residents that this work is being done. Um, I think it would be quite positive to be able to say to them, hey, you know, we, we get some good information in terms of uh, recommendations and a newsletter on putting together an emergency kit and, you know, keeping your eyes and ears open and subscribing to the notification system and all that. Uh, but be aware there's actually a, a significant review being done, review and update you know, an assessment and such. And uh, I think that would be a positive thing just to let people know. And rather than, you know, I'm thinking of something I'm oftentimes in chasing uh, Rob and others for updates on flood mitigation or whatever to be put into our uh, newsletter. And that's the sort of thing I'm looking for here, I guess, rather than me try to put words to this, which may not be very <laughs> well scripted. It, I'd rather have it come from, from, uh, Stu or Rob or something like that. Rick. If if you agree, I think I think it'd be a that would be my recommendation. We actually, let people know. I think that's a great. I think it's a great idea, Norm. Yeah, we can certainly put it into the next uh, newsletter. Get it to everybody. Um, I'm not sure about putting it on the web page, but we could certainly put it on the newsletter mm -hmm. when that comes out. And of course, just tell them this is available for everybody to see. It's a it's a public document. Yeah, I think we could do something like that. Another, I have no problem doing that. It's a good idea. Another question for Stu, uh, uh, Rob. Uh, uh, Stu, um, I'll I'll just go to the meat of the matter. Uh, I live on Jameson Road, and uh, in the Ghost Wipers area, and uh, it's been established that that is probably one of the highest risk areas in the province for for wildfire because of fuel buildup. And I've been um, talking to uh, Rob and Council about uh, trying to get uh, uh, an understanding from forestry and what their plans are to deal with this because it's just going to continue and we've seen uh, major fires in BC, you know, Alberta, Slave Lake, uh, Fort McMurray, high level. Uh, anyway, um, would you be connected with them, uh, let's say, as an example, with forestry and uh, what uh, your understanding of their tactics will be to deal with this problem? So, um, I think the, the short answer to that would be no. Um, the, the hazard and risk vulnerability assessment will identify that wildfire is a threat. And I would suggest it'll probably show up as a, as a fairly significant threat uh, within the MD. Um, from that point then, there will be a section in, in the Municipal Emergency Management Plan that the AMD can follow from a wildfire management perspective 
or, or from a wildfire response perspective. And in that hazard specific plan, it will reference that Alberta Forestry is responsible for managing wildfire in these parts of your MD and not on other parts of your MD, depending on whether it's within the forest protection area or not. So, but to go to Alberta Forestry and say, uh, what are your plans? Um, I think you would already hear that their plans are that they respond to wildfire when it occurs. Um, does that help with your question? It does help. Uh, it's not uh, the answer that I wanted to hear, <laughs> but uh, um, I've, I've attended uh, several lectures uh, by uh, some people that are uh, um, actually professors in this field. And, uh, and we had a presentation uh, to council and it was a pretty dire uh, prediction of uh, it, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't uh, if it was a win. Uh, so um, I'm, I understand what you're saying and, and it's probably beyond the scope of what you've been asked to do. However, uh, I sure would like to see uh, some um, suggested um, uh, ways to deal with this problem uh, that are not uh, visible today. Yeah, so I think... Um there will be ways to deal with the response to a wildfire within the MD. But I think it's important to keep in mind that uh, the Municipal Emergency Management Plan is not a plan that deals with prevention of wildfire. It's a plan that deals right. with response to wildfire uh, once it has occurred. And, yeah. and then the Fire Smart Plan is the one that, that deals with you know, preventative measures. Okay, good point. Good point. You know, it is. It is a. Uh, um, and uh, and my retort to that is that uh, in every case that uh, that I've heard these lectures uh, uh, by uh, professional foresters uh, have said uh, that. Um, if a fire gets going in this area, there's no way you're going to put it out. So I understand what you're saying is, uh, is this is this is uh, not fire prevention. This is a response to a, a wildfire, and that's what you'd be dealing with. Uh, however, I'm I guess I've said enough on that. Thank you. Okay, um, does anyone have any more questions for, for Stu or, or myself or Rick? Okay, seeing none, could I get a motion uh, from the members just to uh, receive the uh, work plan as being, so for information being satisfactory for the purposes of the committee? I'll make that motion, Rob. Okay, Paul. Paul. Okay, call the vote. All in favor? Great, thank you. Will do. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you, guys. Is it okay, uh, uh, Rob, if if I just uh, uh, listen in on the rest of the meeting? It's it's a public meeting. You're more than welcome to. Okay. Thanks. I'll just mute my mic and listen in. All right, uh, Kevin. We've got that item finished. Uh, I don't see any more information coming through. We're not having a closed meeting. 
So let's go back up to number five. And that was the update from districts and director. And that was the verbal. So I guess looking at uh, Rick or Tom, if you've got anything, uh, any updates you'd like to share with the committee? Uh, <clears throat> well, more than the, um, I guess I could start um, talking for the fire department. All three fire departments were, uh, let me see here. I got the database open. I didn't really get any. Looks like that we're right about 100 calls this year. So far this year, uh, I think that's about 30% less than we would have had this time last year. I think that's due to a lot less um, medical calls. Um, the AHS and uh, medical first responder program um, mandated that fire first responders would only go to the most serious accidents or or or. Uh, uh, Anyhow, uh, I think that's a big reduction is in the um, in the amount of medical calls we're being requested to go to. And then there also been a few less motor vehicle accidents just because there's less people traveling. Uh, you know, we'll see if that changes much. Um, the fire departments have uh, just resumed having practices in the last, uh, in about the middle of June, we started having practices again in Exha. I think uh, Tom's had one and, and Jameson is... Uh, they're uh, they're planning one as well, so we're slowly getting back into business. The guys when they're in truck when they come to the hall and work in close proximity, they're still wearing uh, uh, procedure masks and they're sanitizing their hands and everything they touch, and then uh, they're sanitizing their trucks once once they get out. And of course, inside the truck when they're really close proximity, they're wearing the barrier um, the uh, procedure mask. Um, We've been getting quite, we're getting uh, fairly well stocked as far as the PPE supplied from the, uh, the POC in Edmonton. Uh, so that's, that's uh, looking better. And we're also able to get some of these things, uh, you know, you know, commercially from our normal suppliers. I just got a, uh, a few boxes of uh, N95 masks if we need them. So. I, I think um, the other thing I'd like to say about fire department is we've had a couple of responses lately where we've had all three fire departments call to an incident. And that's because, uh, you know, lacking, a uh, little bit lacking in manpower. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've been uh, teaming up on some of the incidents there. The most recent one was uh, uh, a barn fire at the Two Rivers Ranch uh, in near Coast Lake. And all three fire departments were there working on that one. So anyway, I think that that's about all we got for uh, the fire department, although I know uh, Tom can, will probably add to it. He might talk about some work we've been doing with the Sundry Fire Chief. Um, and, you know, Director of Emergency Management, we've, uh, you know, we had a, it wasn't, although it wasn't a state or local emergency, we did have a lot of activity, a lot of MD resources went into uh, helping the residents down on uh, Pigeon Mountain Drive and Mount McGilvery Drive. Um, and it's, uh, you know, the groundwater thankfully is going down now and and uh, things are looking a little bit better there. We had Team Rubicon was stationed in the Exshaw Fire Hall um, so they could work on some of the homes that needed needed the kind of work. Like uh, Team Rubicon is a nonprofit organization and they um, they go around and they, they remove... Uh, wallboard and stuff from flooded basements and then they uh, they spray something in in the basements to stop the uh, mildew and, and mold and then they uh, they also come back and help reinstall the wallboard when the, when it's ready so and you know I, I think that's that's just a brief summary like I say there was a lot a lot of stuff done by uh, by MD staff and it's still ongoing most of it's right now with uh, the ESS people uh, you know, with uh, programs and, you know, mental health and things like that for the, the residents down there. So I think that, that's about all I could say at this time for a, a report. Okay. Any questions for Rick? Okay. 
Uh, no question for Rick, but it's my understanding Graymont volunteered a lot of pumps to help out in the area, which I think was greatly appreciated. And the MD, as you just pointed out, did all they could as well. So hopefully uh, that's the kind of response we can always get in this community. It was appreciated. It was. We also received uh, pumps and hoses from DEFCON. That's the contractor for Heckshaw Creek, as as well as the uh, Alberta Emergency Management Agency. They gave us access to their warehouse where they have a lot of supplies and equipment, and we're able to utilize those also. So a lot of hel helping hands on this project. Uh, Tom, can you give us a brief update, please? Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes. Good. Um, so, as Rick mentioned, he's pretty much covered off everything. It's been, we've been fairly quiet out, out on this end, which is surprising given the volume of traffic up here and the and the population that's, there's actually a um, semi-permanent population living in the forestry of talking to a uh, CEO the other day, feels that there's probably um, a couple of thousand people living semi-permanently in the forested areas uh, between the campgrounds and the wild the wild land and and they're having lots of fun and issues with uh, with campfires and abandoned campfires and stuff like that but our uh, call volume into that area has been uh, been pretty minimal based uh, um, basically on the fact that um, Conservation officers have a, are having a pretty high presence up there as well, um, and I'm not sure Rick must know this. They've been doing some um, fire smarting, with prescribed burning up near Camp Camasol and uh, Camp Mockingbird, which is the Girl Guide Camp. Um, they haven't always kept us um, updated on when they're burning, so we've had a couple of uh, smoke query calls, um, not through dispatch but just through um, private citizens, but. Forestry has a pretty good presence up there. They've got a couple of hack crews up um, managing the fires and, and um, making sure that everything's out when they're done. So, you know, we haven't we haven't had to go on those nuisance calls. Um, Rick alluded to our uh, coordination with uh, Kevin Miller, the fire chief of the Cremona and District Fire Department. Um, we had a couple of calls onto a road in the very north end of the uh, MD called Stud Creek Road. Um, and also we had another one on uh, Benjamin Creek Road, not that long ago, a medical call, motorcycle accident. Um, and in consultation with, with Kevin, we have looked at the map that was previously in use within the agreement between the MD of Mountain View and the uh, MD of Bighorn. And the boundaries for those responses were redrawn uh, because by doing actual physical on the ground driving rather than relying on Google Maps, um, we determined that the Cremona Fire Department, because they have the paved road all the way through to the beginning of the Stud Creek Road up by the burnt timber gas plant or fallen timber gas plant, the one that's not there anymore. Um, so they can actually get to the junction of Stud Creek Road and Highway 40 almost simultaneously with us and that's a and it's a fair it's a 45 to 50 minute response time from Benchlands and the same from um, Cremona so anything east of that location uh, they are um, dem demonstrably faster going from Cremona to just about anywhere on Stud Creek Road so as a result the map was resubmitted and I think it was um, I think Rick had it. He probably showed it to to, to you, Rob. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to go through the procedure to get that ratified. There were a couple of issues in there where he had some other um, the map that shows his coverage area with from Cremona and the Mountain View doesn't cover the south side of uh, the red the south side of the Red Deer River. Um, it still showed Sundry going in there. So I think. Um, Rick was going to look at, at addressing that um, with the feeling was that we should, when that map is redrawn, ensure that Cremona is tasked with 
all of the area south of of the Red Deer River um, because they can get there fast faster than Sundry. There are some properties that Sundry can get to off of uh, oh shoot I'm having a coal camp road um, that should stay in Sundry's coverage area, but uh, that was the main thing with with the mapping and the coverage. We also changed the uh, the boundary within the forested area to the east of Highway 40, and that would include the Benjamin Creek Road where we went on the medical call. Benjamin Creek Road is gated um, about 10 kilometers in from Highway 40. So the, the map is hopefully indicating that um, we will respond to Benjamin Creek Road via Highway 40 as far as that gated uh, the gate on the, on the road. And then um, Cremona, an area will come in from the eastern end of that road and they access that up past the gas plant as well. So hopefully that map indicates that. And then we placed a, a point on Harold Creek Road um, about five to 10 kilometers, between five and 10 kilometers east of Highway 40 that will remain with um, Station 167 being the primary response into that area. And that's where we've had that's where we had the logging truck roll over. We had the, the vehicle over the cliff. We had the plane crash with the two people that died. That would be that. That's all in um, the response area that we're quicker to get to. So hopefully that map, you know, it, when it's done in its uh, in you know final version in its entirety, will reflect all of those changes. Um, the other thing that Kevin's giving us a hand with, he's a, a, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way. He's a radio geek. Um, and so he's giving us a lot of input and a lot of uh, assistance with the changeover to the AFRAX radios. Um, and it's been pretty beneficial and Rick's still um, working closely with Kevin on that. Um, though, as Rick mentioned, we've started to do practices again, concentrating on um, good trying to do outdoor stuff so that we can maintain our social distancing. So a lot of pumping and a lot of a lot of, uh, uh, we've only had one, so that was kind of the beginning of it. And when we did move inside to do truck checks and that type of thing, it's, um, you, you know, you were either social distanced or you were wearing, they were, everybody was wearing a mask. Um, we have, we are at school, we do have an, uh, a plan to attempt a day of uh, slope rescue training with the uh, Cremona District Fire Department um, up on Harrow Creek Road, um, probably in the, 8th of August and we'll have to see how that goes because um, my training officers as well as um, his and his and the OHNS guys have to kind of get together and how are we going to do it how are we going to work together because they know the health of their crew and we know the health of our crew and we're comfortable with that but um, that being said we might as well figure out how to do it in a training session before we get thrown into the um, deep end of the of the pool with a you know being required to work um, in, in in tandem to do a to do a rope rescue, but if we can figure this stuff out ahead of time, are you doing a high angle rescue, at home or sorry, Stay. are you doing high angle rescue? No, we don't do high angle rescue. We only do um, low slope rescue. Um, okay, high, we don't have a. We don't really have the necessity to do high angle. Plus, it's a higher level of. Uh, training and certification to do high angle um, and maintaining that certification is is pretty difficult so just low slope we leave the high angle to the to the uh, for park rangers um, okay thank you no worries and i think that's about it we've got lots of projects on the go and everything got put on hold <laughs> for the last two or three months but um well, hopefully we'll get back into into a regular Practice, get our program up and running again. Okay, uh, any questions for Tom? I have none. Um, I have, do, do have one thing. Uh, Wayne Deck wasn't able to make it, so he hasn't, he can't say anything for the Jameson Road um, Fire Department, but uh, uh, on his behalf, he's they're excited. They've uh, made, they've started their order for the new truck they're getting. Um, and there was, there's going to be a meeting with the, uh, with uh, like it's going to be a virtual meeting with uh, 
factory, people right at the factory in South Dakota where it's being built, and the uh, local representative here, and then uh, myself and Wayne and Brad. So they're excited to get this project, uh, you know, off the ground. It's been quite a quite a while coming. So. Tom. Sorry, I, I did have one other, it's kind of a comment slash question probably directed at you, Rob. Rob. Um, I mean, as Rick mentioned, we were, um, we assisted over at the Two Rivers Ranch Fire on the Morley Reserve, or I guess, I don't know if it's reserve land or what its status is at any rate. Um, we were there with a couple of pieces of apparatus uh, and um, quite, a, quite a number of crew, and it was advantageous um, one of the things that we found, um, and just quickly, I'll just touch on the fact that because of the lack of water, I mean, it, we were lucky because it was basically a surrounded ground. The building was, was pretty much gone. Uh, there was a few upright timbers and some framework left, but the majority of it was on the ground. Most of it was containment, site containment, and then extinguishment and, and dampening down to the point where um, we could turn it over and leave it with, uh, I don't know whether I think Jameson Road stayed on scene for quite a while. Um, but one, one lesson that came out of that that I think is pertinent is um, water supply. Um, we had some issues with uh, what we wound up with on scene was um, 167 Rescue, which has 1,000 gallons of water on it, um, 168 engine, which has 1,000 gallons of water, and um, uh, the engine, the old the 167 engine that has 1,000 gallons of water on it. And I don't know, I think the x -Shock truck that came down only carried 800. Um, there was a, some difficulty, um, and Rick can address it if he wants or, or not, um, with getting the tender from x -Shock. Um And what it, what it forced us to do was have multiple trucks running back and forth to Morley um, frequently because they could only shuttle 1,000 gallons at a time where um, if you have a tender on scene, you can have two to 3,000 gallons of water on scene. Um, and I think it just points to the uh, advantage of having, of carrying on with our vehicle acquisition plan and program with, uh, with a tender um, here rather than the 1,000 gallon engine. It did yeoman service, um, Eric Butters and uh, one of our other members, Don, um, Dan Hode were on it, and they ran back and forth uh, numerous times from the scene to Morley and got water from the hydrant, brought it back to the scene, supplied it. Thousand gallons doesn't last very long when you're when you're running a couple of hand nozzles at 100 or 125 gallons a minute. It goes pretty quick. Um, so there were times when we didn't have any water. We had to manage the scene fairly um, carefully because. Um, Brad Coleman and I were in discussion and we tried to make, we made sure that there was not a point where we had zero water on site. There was always a truck left. All three of the other vehicles, 167 engine, 168 engine, and 169 um, rescue were all on the road going to, going to or coming from Morley with water. So at times we had to shut down our firefighting operations um, to maintain some backup water in case of emergencies. Um, and it's not a very comfortable situation. So, um, like I said, I think it really points to the, to the, to the value of, of what's in the plan going down the road of having a second tender within the MD. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, and for the, for the life of me, and I don't know if Rob knows where I'm going with this, I can't remember what was in the projection for that a year for that tender. Do you recall, or does Rick recall? I'd have to look at the capital project. Perhaps Rick, Rick has it more easily at hand. Okay. Uh, I don't think I don't think I do. I think it's down at the at the office in the in the office. Okay. Uh, it's just just something that I wanted to point out uh, on that. And that, like I said, it's a good thing that that was a surround and drown, and there was little or no exposures. If you have that same issue within a hamlet or within a residential, uh, rural residential area where you have exposures and you have potential, that's 
that's a very difficult situation. I mean, we would have been having to call in, um, you know, we probably could have called in Cochran with a, with a tender and another truck. Um, that, that would have been a solution if there, if it had, a, if the situation had have dictated that we would have done, we would have had to do that and maybe looking beyond, um, for that. So, um, it's just something that we, we need to consider if, you know, if that same situation occurs again with greater, um, risk and liability involved in a, in a structure fire, um, then, you know, I'm not, and I'm not a hundred percent sure what the issue was why we couldn't get the uh, um, tender out of the tender out of that shot. It would have made it would have made a significant difference to uh, to my comfort level on the scene to have had a tender doing that shuttle operation. It's like carrying pails of water to a fire instead of having a 500 gallon tank sitting right there. Tom, so. um, um, I know we have uh, foam on the uh, bush buggies. Uh, is there any place for uh, foam on uh, when you got a fire like that uh, uh, you know I, I'm really out of my element here I have no idea whether there's a, a way to fit a foam apparatus onto a tender yeah there's no uh, there there are ways um, most of the trucks within the fleet uh, and I can't speak for Exshaw um, but they have we have onboard foam tanks so we can actually produce foam through a number of discharges so we already have foam on there in addition to the water and there are other um, uh, ways of doing it if if it's not built into the truck you can buy a, you can add a foam inductor and use um, five gallon pails of foam and you set your inductor level at whatever you want one percent and then it's uh, it's a flow thing flow through it goes at the pump panel and then it produces okay. at the nozzle. So yeah, there, so, there are there. So did you use foam on that fire? We use, we use, we used a bit. Um, um, X one six eight didn't have any, um, so there was no foam coming out of their truck, and we but we had foam. Okay. So yeah, and does that help? I, um, yeah, it does. It does help. It it. Um, increases the capacity of the foam to absorb heat and extinguish your fire. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, foam foam is beneficial. Yeah. Thank you. So I'll I'll just be really brief, and so we can end this. Anyhow, the the answer to why there wasn't the tender didn't come out from extra is because there wasn't a qualified operator to to drive it down there. So that's a that's tandem axle truck. You have to have a class two license or better, and we didn't have someone qualified to drive it, so it had to sit next shot. So it's uh, yeah, it'd be a big benefit. It's a three thousand gallon uh, tank, and and uh, you know, so obviously it's going to bring a lot more water to the party. Um, the kind of tender Tom's talking about, it's going it's it's going to be only about fifteen hundred gallons, so it's you know maybe two thousand. But uh, it's going to be, you know, there's no argument that, uh, you know, water's, water is an issue most, uh, most places we are and that we have in the rural area. You know, it just always is going to be a problem. How many volunteers do you have in Exshaw that have a Well, we have, we have 18 on the books. Um, there's several that don't live in Exshaw, they, um, but they, live, they work in Exshaw and they are able to respond from work. So they're helpful when they're working and allowed to leave. And then we have uh, a couple that have been taken out of action on account of the, the COVID. They're not allowed to report. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, we're, that's one of the reasons, like I said, we've been having trouble raising manpower in Exxon. I, I went on two calls this week with one other guy. That's all we had available in Exxon this week, for, you know, during, during normal working hours. That's. I gotta say that is unusual. Usually we got a pretty good crew, but you know these guys are all volunteers. They all work elsewhere, or they you know it's summer holidays. So I think it's gonna be a problem all summer. And uh, you know I, I can't really say anymore. Uh, Tom, I've got a question about that mapping. So the fire agreement is actually with Mountain View County. So is the chief of Cremona? Is he sort of 
working through that with his uh, with Mountain View to have the proper maps? Or is that something that uh, you guys are working with the chief on? Yes, that's correct. He, he's, he, we're working with him to facilitate that because he knows the area. It's his area. It's his coverage area. But, um, yeah, he has to go to his council and um, his fire authority within Mountain View County to get it ratified. Um, okay. Just similar to any agreement, you know, like Rick and I can figure this stuff out, you know, um, but we still have to come to administration and council to get it approved and ratified. So same thing there. Now, as I recall, we had we had to replace the maps. Rick, were those maps ever replaced in the in the agreement? Well, my my recollection is is that the agreement was signed, but the maps weren't available. That's right. The maps are coming later. So, to me, I I would these I don't know what maps are contained in the agreement now, uh, but these I think these could easily be replaced. Uh, replace them. You know, like they, it, it's not like somebody initialed the maps that are in in there because they would have come at a later date after the agreement was already signed by or ratified by council. So, but yeah, we can. Uh, we're working with our dispatch centers. You know, the Cremona department's dispatched by Red Deer, and and uh, Kevin's doing his job in implementing them. It's going to take. It takes a little while. Uh, according to him, it's going to take a little while to get that uh, actually done in the Red Deer system. Uh, Calgary 911 is able to, they're going to be able to make the changes almost, like I think the update could be done this week. And uh, so we will have people responding pro uh, appropriately already. Yeah, I think this is more of a housekeeping uh, item. Yes, I believe so. Like there's no, there's no cheese, there's no financial impact. You know the the fees like our, our agreement the fees in there aren't changing at all uh you know so i i don't see it as uh yeah it's it is truly just a housekeeping measure okay Rick, a question for tom uh, uh on that two rivers fire uh i believe uh ghost lake is probably quite a bit closer to uh than Morley is, is that uh, just uh, convenience of the uh, the water supply at Morley or? Uh, yeah, the biggest, Morley, yeah, the biggest rationale for that decision, Paul, at the time was the fact that it's, it's not, it's not um, a simple operation to get down and draft the water uh, out at the river. And probably by the time you drive down to the boat ramp, which would be the, lo the logical place to, to do a drafting operation, uh, right, uh -huh. you know, and they can go to, they could go to Morley, right across from the church, tie into a pressure hydrant, and they put a thousand gallons yeah. of water on in a fraction of the time it would take to suck it out of the lake. Yeah, I've used that uh, a couple times. Uh, that's pretty, it's a pretty good system. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I understand what you mean about uh, getting all the uh, equipment, uh, and you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to draft it nearly as fast from Ghost Lake. Uh, I don't imagine. No, I mean those operations. You, you your your basic. Um, if you have the apparatus um, and a and a patent to, or a good location to pull water from, uh, you know you would have to dedicate a piece of apparatus um, to be there and actually. They would be they would become the hydrant that you know yeah that's right yeah 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 thank you okay well, thank you rick thank you tom um if there's any no any more questions uh, let's just move on to number nine which is next meeting looking at I, the, sorry yeah i'd like to jump in here for just a moment since rick and tom both mentioned directly or indirectly of the safety of the volunteers in our MD. And I do a lot of reading on the internet and there's right now a lot of studies out of Europe showing that uh, okay, high levels of vitamin D is having a very positive impact on anybody uh, either with COVID or protecting them from COVID. And I'm wondering, and there's no downside for taking vitamin D unless you take 
well, somewhere is like, okay, 200 international units per day. Uh, and the recommendation in most cases is between eight, okay, 200,000 I'm talking about. And the recommendation is between eight and 10,000 units per day provides amazing protection for getting COVID as well as a less severe okay, case of COVID if you do get it. And I haven't heard the same kind of studies in Canada anywhere. Maybe they're going on and they're just not being reported. But I'm wondering if, if we are in a position to recommend that people in volunteer service protect themselves by starting a vitamin D regime of, well, 10,000 units per day as major protection from the virus. Comments? I have a uh, comment. Uh, um, I, think, um, I think before we did that, uh, we would have to have uh, uh, Alberta Health uh, approve something like that uh, because uh, um, these, uh, I, I understand vitamin D and, and I, I agree with what you said. I understand you can take as much as, as you want and the body only takes what it needs and the rest goes out the door. And uh, so, um, but I certainly would be reluctant as a counselor to, um, to recommend something like that that wasn't fully recommended by Alberta Health Services. Well, I, yeah, and I agree, and that's, uh, that's been my position when, when we're looking at things. Uh, but we take our lead from Alberta Health, and uh, I tell my guys, like, we're part of the medical first responder program, so they're making the recommendations. They're the ones that are saying we should be wearing a mask, and just like to everybody, but especially us, uh, you know, wearing, wearing masks when in close proximity, uh, they're like, so it's nearly 100% of the time and lots of sanitation, lots of, of uh, decontamination and and uh, pre-cleaning and stuff like that. So, you know, if they came out with a recommendation and said, yeah, we can protect ourselves by taking vitamin D, but uh, that aside, my wife does have me taking vitamin D. So it's something, you know, I mean, we got to be careful about what we recommend because there's a lot of cures on Facebook, right? And uh, I, I don't think, I think I'd sooner have it uh, vetted by a professional body like Alberta Health. So that's my two points uh, worth. Yeah, my point is this is research being reported by governments and scientific organizations in, in Europe. My suggestion is, is it some quick way to contact Alberta Health and say, have you looked at any of this research? That's basically where I'd like to go. I am not suggesting that we put out an official okay, recommendation because as Paul pointed out and Rick, that could cause problems. But I'm wondering if we could get permission. I think we're heading outside the scope of the Emergency Services Committee. Thank you. I'll drop it at that point. Okay, I think we should move on to number nine on the agenda item, which is next meeting. Looking at the sequence and staging of tasks, which we have in the work plan, looks to be the next meeting will be Thursday, October the 1st, 2020. Does anybody have a preference for a time of day? What was that date again, Robert? Thursday, October the 1st. Okay. Are we assuming virtual meeting or are we too far in the future to even mention that aspect? I think we're too far in the future. I don't know what's going to happen. I think yes. we have to, I think we have to plan for virtual, but that can be adjusted depending on what happens with this pandemic.